Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My name is Irene Stone, and I will be the moderator for tonight's forum. The League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara is sponsoring tonight's forum for the candidates for Santa Barbara County Supervisor, 1st District. We hope this forum will inform you, the voters, of the candidates' views on issues of importance to you. The League does not support nor oppose any candidate. Thank you for attending. Thanks to Viviana Marsano for uh, Transil Pro, who will be providing simultaneous trans, uh, translation from English to Spanish. Headphones are available upon request. Also to Gary Atkins Sound Systems for the audio. Thanks. <laughs> Deserves it. I'll be his. <laughs> Thanks to TVSB for videotaping the forum. Uh, they are live streaming it today via the League's Facebook page. The video will be online at the League's YouTube site, available via our website, lwvsb.org. Candidates material is on the table at the back. Information about the local League of Women Voters Organization and voter registration is also on the back table. All are welcome to join the League. Scholarships are available. And also to make a tax deductible contribution to the League's Education Fund, which finances uh, voter education programs such as this. Please refrain from outbursts and displays, uh, signs, t-shirts, etc., and hold your applause to the end. This will help us discuss more issues and maintain our neutral tone. Also, please turn off cell phones, Unauthorized videos are not allowed. Well, we would like to welcome our candidates this evening uh, in alphabetical order. Laura Capps, presently president of the school board, and Doss Williams, our incumbent uh, first district supervisor. Thank you. Thank you Here's how the forum works. We use the traditional League of Women Voters process and ground rules which the candidates have agreed to follow. To maintain civility and the issue-oriented nature of our forum, we do not allow negative comments about other candidates' character or qualifications, but rather ask speakers to address their own qualifications and vision for office and their views on issues facing the, country, uh, the county and the first district. After I ask each question, timers with the league uh, track the time remaining and hold up cards with one minute, 30 second warnings and stop signs. The candidates will make brief statements up to two minutes each. I will then ask them questions depending on the time available. Each candidate will be given a maximum of one and one half minutes to answer each question. We will rotate the order of responses. There will be a short break after the first several questions. We will collect the cards and, sor and sort the answer questions at the break. If you write your question in Spanish, we will have it translated. Our format does not provide time for audience members to directly question the candidates. When the forum resumes after the break, the candidates will answer as many questions as possible within the remaining time. At the end, the candidates will each have an opportunity to make a closing statement of no more than two minutes. All right, now let's get started by a uh, lot system. Uh, Doss Williams will be making the first statement. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for participating in democracy. Um, uh, one of my folks is saying, stand up, um, but uh, um, I, I think that will be difficult on the mic, um, but uh, uh, the, um, I'm going to handle this linearly, because sometimes I think that's the best way to explain a story. Um, I was a very strange kid growing up. Uh, I, uh, maybe it arose out of um, growing up in poverty, maybe it arose out of um, growing up close, closer to nature. Um, my grandfather thought it was because God had put a burden on my heart. Um, whatever it was, I was, I was angry. Um, I was angry that the world uh, is so far from the way it should be. Uh, as a boy, I would preach about it. 
uh, and write poetry against that injustice, but as an adult, I knew that it, I could only be fulfilled if I made a real impact for our environment and for the poor. I'm so grateful to you, the voters, for giving me a chance to affect justice in the world, and I've consistently brought you results on what I have promised. With the help of my colleagues, I've made the county go from lagging behind, which it did, uh, to being a real leader in the fight against climate change. Uh, I'll detail that a little bit more, but a couple of the highlights are we're leaving Southern California Edison's energy procurement so that we can buy a higher degree of renewable energy. We're building an anaerobic digester to make sure your food waste doesn't become methane pollution. And we uh, just approved a wind farm on Tuesday that will double the amount of alternative energy in this county. Thank you. And now, uh, Ms. Caps. Thank you. Thanks to the League for doing this. And I love it that it's here in our library, <coughs> like our public schools. I think that libraries are the cornerstone of our democracy, public libraries. So it's nice to be here. And thank you. So um, I'm a kid who grew up going to this library. I was born and raised in the first district, went to schools in the first district, uh, went away to college, and then a career in Washington, DC, uh, working in the White House and the Senate. and national nonprofits, but I always knew I wanted to come back here, and now I've been back in the first district raising my son uh, and getting involved in a lot of nonprofits with many of you also work, serving on the school board. And I say that because I know the first district, and I don't believe that things have ever been this challenging here in the first district. We have climate change that's wreaking havoc on um, our way of life in the terms of the fires that we're dealing with with the mudslides that we're dealing with, with the drought that we just went through seven years and sea level rise, we have such challenges here. The second thing is poverty. Poverty abounds here, homelessness abounds. We can feel it, we see it, we see it here in this library. And in the past three years, I believe we've been behind the curve because special interests have been driving that agenda our, and our community has paid for it. Our county leadership has spent too much time on special interest issues. At the board, there's been over 60 hours of hearings on cannabis, but on homelessness, four. On climate change, just 10. On poverty, zero. I'm running because we need a new direction. I have experience in each one of these issues, a long track record, whether it's on the national level, working on poverty, minimum wage with Ted Kennedy, working here locally, making sure that low-income kids get fed, whether it's climate change, working with Al Gore, or right here at the Community Environmental Council, putting in charging stations and solar. We can turn this around, but we need to get money out of politics. That's what we need to do. Thank you very much. Now, going to some of our first questions, the first one really has to do with uh, governance here. The first district includes many unincorporated communities from Kiyama to Montecito. What is the best way to provide local government in unincorporated uh, communities? And what do you see as the role of the first district supervisor in this process? I guess we start with uh, Ms. Caps. Thank you. That's a wonderful question because it's true. A lot of people, when I'm doing my, we've done 45 meet and greets in people's living rooms. Some of you have hosted them who are here. Um, and the first question, actually I've, I addressed the question, what does the county supervisor do? Especially important in unincorporated areas. Where are your front lines? I'm speaking as though I have the job, I don't have it yet. But it's the front lines of government. It's the way in which uh, people are safe at night in their homes because they've gotten the right uh, emergency information on their phones. It's the quality of their schools. It's the quality of their air. So if I have to put it in a, in a sentence, the, count, the role of the county supervisor is to keep us safe and protect and enhance our quality of life. And it's no more, it's so much more important, especially in areas that don't have their own city councils. And that's the areas where you have to really listen. You have to be as present as you can, and you have to have an open mind and listen to all sides, and not just those who have political influence, but all sides. And that's what I've done on the school board, the, the kind of reputation that I've earned. And so it's really important as a county supervisor to be everywhere and to be listening, but not just listening, following through. And that's what I'm excited to do. Thank you. And Mr. Williams. 
Well, for anybody who thinks that things haven't gotten better, I've just got a quick history lesson. Uh, in, in, in Rome, uh, during the Roman Empire, all dinner parties had to end by the time it, before it was dark. And the reason was there was no urban planning, and you could get lost during the day. You could definitely get lost at night. There was no real police force, so you'd probably lose your money um, or your life um, and all the fire uh, uh, companies were privatized. Uh, so uh, I hope it gives you a sense that of what kind of, of progress we make as a civilization that we have a government that the primary purpose of it is to provide public safety. Uh, we have uh, the largest fire department, the county. Uh, uh, so the county provides the largest number of engine companies, for fire protection in all incidents, whether or not you're in the unincorporated zone. Um, we uh, fund the sheriff's department, um, uh, including the jail, which is the most, one of the most expensive components. And I think the best way for that government to reach you beyond the, the great activities of our county employees and our county public safety workers is door to door. Um, on this campaign, um, we have gone to 30,000 doors and gone talk to 7,000 people. And we, um, you get a whole different sense of what priorities are um, when you just wait and listen to public hearings versus when you talk to people face to face in Thank every neighborhood. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, on to our next question, and of course, one of the major issues is climate change and what is to be done about it. And so we'll ask you, what, if anything, should county government do regarding the climate crisis? And please be specific about actions you favor for utility system resiliency, disaster preparation, carbon footprint direct, uh, reduction. And we start with uh, Mr. Williams. Well, a, a good uh, set of researchers out of UCSB have indicated, based on compiling every bit of climate readings in the last 30 years, that our average temperature in the South County has gone up 2.4 degrees Celsius, and if the trend continues, we'll go up a total of eight, over 30 years, we'll go up a total of 8 degrees Celsius over 60. That should scare all of us. That's Celsius, not Fahrenheit. And that temperature rise has been associated with an increased fre frequency of sundowner winds, um, lower fuel moisture, more frequent fires. Um, climate change, I've known for a long time, is the moral issue of our age, one future generations will remember us for, but it will also affect us right here. And so the county um, is doubling our, share, our, our renewable energy portfolio. Um, the anaerobic digester we're building as we speak is the equivalent of taking 28,000 cars off the road. Um, we need to make sure we approve housing close to jobs since the, the worst part of our climate impacts is being exacerbated by people driving farther and farther. Uh, and we are going to go towards 100% renewable energy in the county because in 11 months' time, we will be part of a five-county effort um, of procuring energy. Thank you. And Ms. Capps. Thanks for the question. This is one of the issues that drew me into this election. This is a historic time in our county, especially the first district, when it comes to climate change and resiliency. And I have a background in it. I've worked in national government and advocacy on climate change, working with Al Gore, working with John Kerry, working at Ocean Conservancy to protect our oceans in the face of climate change. But here locally, working with the Community Environmental Council and on the school board, the champion for sustainability. And we're moving so firmly in the right direction on the school board, finally. It took three years of my advocacy, and we're now moving to sustainable schools that are going to be powered by solar with battery storage so that our schools are safe havens in the time of emergency, which we know, unfortunately, is our new normal. That's, and I believe firmly that our schools, again, our cornerstones of democracy, need to be the places that the lights stay on so that kids and families know where to go. There's food that's being served. I think our county needs to step it up. I'm calling for a climate, climate safety plan. It's on my website. 
Uh, I'm not Elizabeth Warren, but I have a lot of plans on my website. Many of them are three, three, four pages long. I encourage you to check them out. But the key to a climate safety plan is bringing in innovation. We have so much innovation from the private sector, the folks that raised the money and had the vision to build nets and had to get the county to kind of come along. I, want, I don't want to just come along. I want to be pushing. I want to be pushing forward. We, this is the time in this district to innovate like we've never innovated before. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's build on this a little bit with um, the question of emergency preparedness, fire and flood protection. What steps, if any, would you recommend be taken to improve emergency preparedness, especially in the first district? And uh, we start with Ms. Caps. Good, good follow-up. Uh, I mean, emergency preparedness, which I have a background in, you, it, it's well known that if for every dollar that you spend in preparedness, you save seven in recovery. So the more that our county is investing, and not just thinking what we can do as a county, but looking, again, to the folks in Montecito who raised the money and had the vision for the nets, or Curtis Skeen, who is uh, trying to clean out those basins, what are the other five things that we should be doing now that we, so we don't have to say, oh, we wish we had done that then, after the next black swan event comes. But because, again, with our climate, we know that this is the new normal. I want to raise the leadership, raise the urgency around this, have more time spent on the Board of Supervisors on these plans, more funding spent, because we know that it's an investment to our future. It's the way that we assure our residents that they're safe. And, and, it, and we also have tools. I strongly believe in looking around at what other heirs are doing, like the nets that were, um, they, they looked around the globe to figure out what's happening. We don't have to figure out all of the answers right here. It's very much my approach to governing, governing and to my professional life. Let's not feel as though we have to come up with all the answers ourselves, but let's harness innovation for the county to be that, that whole so that, so that everyone's brought in on it. We all are scared. This is a scary time with these fires, and it's up to the county to lead and make sure we move forward. Thank you. And Mr. Williams. Well, if it's purely based on dollars uh, being spent, then we, the county has the greatest leadership in public safety that has happened within your lifetime because the amount that we are spending, increased spending, in order to um, uh, ensure greater resilience on flood control and a greater resilience on our public safety network is more than has happened any time in the last 30 years. Um, the, there's $45 million worth of flood control projects that we will be engaged in the next two years. Um, that means an enlargement of one of our debris basins this, this summer, construction of a whole new large one next summer, and various works happening in between. Um, uh, this is a gargantuan effort. Um, at the same time, we are moving towards a borderless dispatch system so that you get the closest available fire engine or paramedic not the closest available one on your side of a city or municipal boundary. Um, that is a serious investment by the county of $8 million to make sure that we can have a common dispatch center and software, uh, of it, uh, but it's something that will unite all the jurisdictions of the county. Um, and this is something that I've been working on for a long time. Um, uh, you might remember when I represented in the legislature, I authored a bill to optimize our not cell to 911 so that you might get the right dispatch center when you call 911. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Caps. Well, I already answered that, but you I'm sorry. Have I done this? Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I got going. the next one. Right. All right. My next question. Well, we are going to change. Uh, we're changing uh, directions a little bit. Hard to overlook the entire question of the cannabis industry. But we have some specific questions, and let's ask about, uh, start with this one. The county has two established, uh, two separate caps on cannabis uh, cultivation, nurseries, and micro-businesses. Should the county adopt different restrictions on cannabis cultivation than the current cap of 186 acres in the Carpinteria overlay zones and 1,575 acres uh, countywide. And we start with Mr. Williams. Well, I think these, the, the cap, that the current cap is a good cap. I am open to a shrinking cap over time. 
Um, the current cap is a um, one that uh, essentially makes the equivalent with the number of lemons, the acreage of lemons in the county. So unless you think we're being overwhelmed by lemons, I think you should consider that's a very, very small crop and a very, very small acreage. Uh, in Carpinteria, um, the, I, I could see it eventually going down to 160 acres. Right now, the cap is 186, which was actually asked for. It's smaller than the cap that, that was asked for by uh, the city of Carpinteria or the urging of some of the uh, you know, anti-cannabis crowd. Um, the, uh, the potential for this community to do things right is high. Not everything has been done correctly, but it's uh, much better than trying to pursue an illusionary policy of a ban. Communities that pursue bans have a uh, very vibrant black market activity, have tons of marijuana operations, and no law enforcement dollars to do anything about it. Um, as our surrounding jurisdictions are. Um, uh, according to the DA, um, or according to our DAs, there are not prosecutions of unpermitted marijuana activity in San Luis Obispo County, which the prohibitionists would like us to imitate. Thank that you. That is not the model Thank we should you. pursue. And now, uh, Ms. Capps. Well, unfortunately, we all know lemons, and cannabis is not lemons. Um, it's untested by our federal government in terms of exposure. We don't know what it means to be little kids, to be, my son is here, to be in classrooms all day long surrounded by cannabis. It's not like lemons. And unfortunately, our county rushed in, opened the floodgates, and we are now the cannabis capital of the state. And without for, forethought, we should have done an economic impact study, speaking of lemons, on the avocado industry. We should have done an economic impact study on the wine industry, which happens to bring $2 billion into this county. None of that happened. Testing wasn't done. Now we're doing testing on the air quality. Things happen after the front. So there's so many things to change. And it doesn't mean calling for a ban. It just means being sensible and protecting the quality of life for the people that we represent. That's what it means. I propose simple things, first of all. Cannabis operators need to pay taxes. We all do. They have to pay their fair share. Secondly, we need to push the boundaries between cannabis and our schools and the people that are suffering because they live right next to them. It's reasonable. It doesn't mean a ban. We can still have it here in this county. Thirdly, we need to decrease the density like even Humboldt County does. They have an actual cap on the acreage per parcel. We have none of that, and industry is funding this whole Thank you very policy. much. Thank you. Um, another part of this has to do with the retail storefront businesses. Uh, the Board of Supervisors directed staff to draw merit based criteria for granting licenses to cannabis retail storefront businesses. What are the main factors that should be included in a merit based system for determining retail storefront cannabis licenses? And uh, we start with Ms. Capps. Yeah, it's about a new industry and, and recognizing that um, it's not the best exposure to children. So like liquor stores, of course, I'm on the school board. We have a federal rule, a thousand feet. We need to be mindful of a new industry and what's being sold and make sure that the surrounding area is not only supportive of it, but okay with it. And I think it's really important for um, a new industry that's starting to not just sort of ready, fire, aim, and just let's let's just push stuff in and have everyone else adapt to it. Let's actually ask what people want. Let's listen. Let's do community meetings that are not, that are actually well publicized and people know about them. That's what a, the kind of leadership I hope to bring to the board is leadership that listens and not just listens, but takes in information from all sides, not a special interest that would happen to be funding my campaign, but all sides, and then follows through. So in terms of dispensaries, I think it's really important as to where they go, and children come first. This is a, this is a gateway drug. Again, I'm fine with adult use of marijuana. I have no problem with it. But this is a gateway drug, and we have to be thinking about what's happening to our children. I see it in the school district. Every meeting, this is an epidemic. Um, we, we, do, we do need rules. This is a society that does need to have rules. 
if you just say bans don't work, that doesn't give anybody a sense of, well, what does work? And we need to have rules. Thank you. And Mr. Williams. Well, what does work is vigorous enforcement of the rules. And in Santa Barbara County in the last five quarters, uh, our cannabis enforcement team has raided now 59 operations and, uh, and taken down 40 something of those operations. Um, it is uh, a vigorous enough enforcement that um, you can, it is correct fact to say that we have um, uh, repossessed more marijuana than the rest of the state combined. Mind you, it is not because we are the biggest grower in the state. I've posed that argument to the planning and development director of Humboldt County. He laughed at it. He said, we have between 12 and 14,000 operations. How many do you think you have? Oh, we've got 70 something, 60 something countywide. Now, it's true that some of them are, are larger in scale, but it, it's a, a incorrect, it is totally incorrect to say that we have anything close to the amount of, hum, of Humboldt. People can say that because of what is on paper. There's a difference between what is on paper and how, the amount of unpermitted grows that are anywhere. Our process actually does have all the community input in the community and the criteria for retail is the, is the interest and the benefits for that community. Uh, and that's going to be a good process. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now just an overall question about agriculture in the area. What would maintain agriculture as a viable industry in Santa Barbara County, particularly the first district? To what extent should agricultural practices and development be regulated? What steps, if any, should be taken to promote agriculture in the Santa Barbara County, particularly the first district? And uh, that starts with Mr. Williams. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think that um, as a, it is in my values that we need to have um, good economic development. And I think ag usually is not tremendously high wage economic development, but the greenhouse industry in Carpinteria has had much higher wages than other farm work. Um, and so I do think that it's in the interest of workers and in the interest of the public to have thriving agriculture. And, uh, the, and that means not regulating it to death, not um, destroying the kind of diversity that we could have in our agricultural sector. Um, I, I'll tell you, it, you can't even join the association um, uh, in, in, of cannabis farmers in Carpinteria without paying $15 an hour plus health benefits starting wage. The average wage is 63000 That's higher than the median income in this community, or the, me the median uh, income in Santa Barbara County. This is uh, providing benefits to a lot of poor, low-income folks. And um, I think that's the reason why we should have the right kind of balance. Um, I think the other is to not believe that agriculture can survive without innovation, without trucks, without greenhouses, without things that at this point are necessary for ag to survive Thank you very in much. an urbanized area. And Ms. And Ms. Capps. That's a good question. I've, I've met with many uh, avocado farmers in Carpinteria and as well as some vintners more in uh, the valley. And I believe we need to uphold, this is an agriculture county, uh, great pride in that. And we do need to treat them with such pride in that in the introduction of a new industry, like I mentioned, should have involved uh, those who were directly impacted. And when you have um, a cannabis farm next to a, an avocado farm and the issues that have arisen without any, again, any sort of foresight or economic impact study or collaboration or, and now sort of after the fact, trying to clean up uh, these messes. So I want to uphold the value of the existing agriculture who, that has been here for decades. I grew up here, I know it, and realize that we need to move more methodically when we introduce new industries, you know, many of whom are from Canada and New York and elsewhere, into our local environment. Um, also, too, I, I appreciate the, the, the role of protecting farm workers is something I'm uh, 
strongly in favor of, and especially women and, and pesticides and things like that. It's a, a role that I've played on the uh, Women's Commission. It's something that we're aware of, and there's talk of a farm, work, farm worker bill of rights. Um, something I'm very interested in seeing and seeing where that could be picked up. I know that it passed in Ventura, but I think that the, far, the role of our farm workers in this county is really vital to us all. Thank you, thank you. Well, now we're going to change to another topic here, and this has to do with campaign contributions. Uh, AB 571 makes campaign contribution limits for state offices, which is now set as a $3,000 default per calendar year, applicable to local elected officials effective January 1, 2021. Counties may adopt different limits if local conditions require them. Do you support different contribution limits for Santa Barbara County and why? And we start with Ms. Capps. Happy to have this question. Yes, I believe that we need limits. I would support that legislation. I think that we don't need necessarily the, 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 the amount that the state is, but I'm open to that, and I appreciate that state law because counties like ours are not living up to what we should be doing. We have no campaign finance limits in this county. I just need to say that again. When I'm at these house parties, people have no idea that you could literally write a check for a million dollars, and there's too much money in our county system, in our city system. And no one until my candidacy in recent memory has been willing to talk about it because they like the status quo. They like to take $62,000 from an industry that they're regulating. That, that protects the way the status quo works. And guess what? That means that other things like homelessness, like housing, things that don't have lobbyists attached to them don't get the priorities that they deserve. So I'm all in favor. I have a plan on my website, five points, First is campaign limits. I studied what Ventura does. Second is um, camp uh, spending limits, voluntary. Third is more transparency. You all should know who's funding whom so that when you read in the newspaper decisions, you understand, oh, that's how that was made. Oh, I get that. That's really important. Fourth, we need an ethics commission or some sort, of, some sort of independent body so that if a group has a grievance, they don't have to go back to the same people who actually develop that policy. And lastly, I don't believe that it's ethical to take money from an interest that you are regulating. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Williams. Well, I mean, all politics is very local in this community. If you had a rule that you could not take money from anybody that could be affected by a county policy, you would not be able to raise any, any money, not just a large amount of money. And I will just tell you that I would be so relieved to have campaign finance limits, right? I mean, so relieved. You know, fundraising as part of campaigns and part of, of making a change, it's like the most unenjoyable experience and it's like being on a, you know, a, a rat wheel, you know, like that, that where you're just, you know, uh, uh, it, it is very masochistic work, okay? And, um, the, but to have real campaign finance reform, you'd need to have a, a component of public financing. Because what other communities' campaign limits doesn't take money out of politics. As long as Citizens United is around, which I would like to change, um, you will not be able to get rid of money in politics because then you just hand over the large, the large campaigns then just do independent expenditures for or against candidates, and they can do as much as they want because of Citizens United. So I have voted for public financing in a bill in the legislature that, that legalizes it in this state. Um, that has been challenged by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, but it looks like we're going to win in a court, and it will become an actuality Thank in this you state. Thank you very much. And Ms. Capps. I'm happy to keep Whoops, talking. sorry. I'd love to. Right. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going on the next question, right. And this is a continuation, essentially. If do you favor contribution limits or disclosure requirements for persons who have matters before the Board of Supervisors? And uh, we do start with uh, Mr. Williams. Sorry. I would hope that those limits would apply to everyone, not just uh, folks who uh, might come and lobby the Board of Supervisors. I think in particular what that does is it is it uh, is a strange way to thank our firefighters and deputy sheriffs after the crises of the last two years is to remove their 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 ability to give directly to candidates 
They work for the county, so they always have uh, uh, you know, things before the board. And traditionally, um, they have been the counterbalance, um, county employees, uh, to the influence of oil. I think proposing taking them out of politics and giving is, is a, really would create a situation where oil has a lot more political power in this county than the fire, police, and uh, our other public employees. That is dangerous. That's a, a good way to lose the third district to North County pro-oil interests, and I don't think it's a good idea. Thank you. Ms. Capps. Yeah, I actually think that's perverse logic. The fact is our county, our firefighters and our first responders should have our support no matter if they give any supervisor a dime of political money. That would be me. If you see me up on that dais and I'm your next supervisor, you will know that I'm not supporting anybody because they happen to give me funding. It's, it's perverse to me. It's not even how I think. And to sort of say, oh, that's the system and we have to uphold it. Well, let's change the system. We can change the system here in this county. Ventura has done it where they don't allow contributions until uh, a supervisor is within a year of their election. It's very, it's not radical. It's just common sense and it's just putting our priorities so that everyone, you all, have the voice of the oil companies. Let's rein in the power of the oil companies. This would apply to them too. I don't believe that money should dictate outcome. It's that simple. Money should not dictate the outcome of policies, and unfortunately, that's the situation that we have here in our county, and that's why I'm running to try to change it. And if I get there March 3rd, I'll change it. Thank you. Well, we're going to be changing another, please hold your place. We're going to be changing uh, topics again. Of course, this is one of our main concerns. What should the county do regarding homeless, mentally ill, and addicted persons? What specific changes and policies do you support? And we start with Ms. Capps. Thank you. Yeah, this is another area that I believe deserves more of our county's attention. Uh, we haven't had many hearings on this at all, yet we have the highest rate of unsheltered homeless that we've seen. I see it on the school board. One in eight kids in our public schools are homeless. Uh, it's just a travesty. It impacts us all. I have a long record of working on poverty. Um, I've worked here in the state of California on the best tool to keep people out of poverty. It's called the Earned Income Tax Credit. I've worked here locally to feed low-income kids, tens of thousands every summer. We now have 50 places around the county where any child can get a free meal. So first and foremost, let's keep people from homelessness. And I bring that up because our homeless now, it's a different situation. Certainly some are mentally ill and addicted, but many are working. Many are working jobs. And we need to keep them who are on the brink out of homelessness. So that's number one. Number two, I want more ideas, innovative ideas. We see that elsewhere. I tend to study. I'm part of a group of 150 local elected officials that get together twice a year to discuss ideas. There's ideas happening all over. For example, Houston has cut their homeless population by 54% since 2011. They set a goal. I think goals are really important for our, our, for our community to galvanize. They said, let's get 100,000 homeless vets off the street. We ha now have 1,600 people, 1,600, that need housing. I want to set a goal. Let's cut that in half by 2024. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Williams. Well, just to add a curiosity, has anybody, how many people in this room have uh, had to either live on the street or in their car for longer than a, two months of their lives. Anybody? Well, this issue is pretty personal to me because I have. Um, I used to live in my, uh, my vehicle at Ledbetter Beach uh, after I had dropped out of high school so that I could go to City College and, and better myself because I could only afford a house uh, in Santa Barbara six months out of the year. Um, so I would do it six months every year. Um, most of what the county does, contrary to what you've heard here tonight, most of what the county does is deal with poverty. Um, and we have 900 units of rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing units in this county. Um, uh, we are expanding the continuum of care in our mental health system radically. Um, but it's not enough. There does need to be more done. But the strategy that works 
is permanent supportive housing combined with street outreach. Street outreach to get people in permanent supportive housing so they can make the transition through. And it's hard to get community support, but we're pushing through and have five new permanent supportive housing projects. One, if you're interested, is Hollister Lofts. So come out to the public hearing on that um, so uh, that we can hear from people who want solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's just take one more question before we uh, have our break. And at that time, we'll want to collect the uh, questions that you have so that we can present them during the second half. All right, so last question for this first half is really about infrastructure. How do you propose to finance deferred maintenance and necessary infrastructure? And uh, we start with uh, Mr. Williams. Well, uh, deferred maintenance is a really big problem, and it's a big problem in just about every jurisdiction of the state. Um, there are some good things happening to address it. Um, one of those is your wisdom of approving the marijuana tax that we put on the ballot. Um, it was uh, $6.7 million last, last fiscal year. Uh, it is on track to be over $10 million, maybe over $11 million this year. And thus far, that has been allocated to things like our libraries, our parks, our, our alternative energy, our climate change work. Um, but it also has been going to our infrastructure work and our uh, emergency reserves. So I, I think it is one way to help augment the, the work that has been done with the gas tax, which you protected at the ballot box, thank you, because that is also creating a lot, and the work that we're do doing with the funds, um, uh, the Southern California Edison Settlement Funds, which will mean that the first district will have uh, more street repair than in many, many years uh, this spring, um, as soon as the rain stops and we can get out and get in construction because we want to fully repair and mitigate all of the damage, not only from the debris flow on in this community, but from all the truck trips, all those sort of impacts that we've had in those intervening two years. And Ms. Capps. Yeah, in, uh, deferred maintenance certainly is a problem and devotes attention. And unfortunately, our cannabis revenue is not doing that. Uh, it fall, fell far short from the aspirational 25 million a year that was expected. Um, and unfortunately, most of the cannabis revenue that has come in is going towards enforcement. While I'm certainly a proponent of enforcement, um, the rest of it doesn't go very far, especially when 62% of cannabis operators paid no dime in taxes last year. We just got these figures. So everyone needs to pull their fair share. The cannabis operators need to pay their taxes. They need to be audited by the county as soon as possible. They should have been audited from the beginning. And that's the way we're gonna pay for other things that deserve our attention, like homelessness, like our schools. There is no direct connection between, unfortunately, it was not written this way, I would have done it this way, that the, any cannabis revenue should go towards our schools. But that is not the case, it's not a fact, and it's not happening. So our county finances need to look elsewhere. I believe in smart strategic planning, like I mentioned earlier, I believe in doing economic impact studies before we move in a new direction, and being as prudent and strategic as possible. The county is a billion dollar budget, most people don't understand that. Yet, so you don't just sort of fire and aim and sort of hope for the best. You be methodical, you do studies. That's the kind of leader I am, that's the kind of listener I am, that's the kind of due diligence that our leaders need to deliver for the, our constituents. I think we're ready now to start our second uh, half and we have received quite a variety of different questions and some of them we're going to group together and really the one we had the most questions about has to do with housing and housing specifically in the first district. So, um, We'll kind of put these together and say, how do you propose to meet the county's need for affordable housing uh, for local employees? We can use that as a part of it. Um, where in the first district would be appropriate, and how do you see that as a, um, a de as developed? And that starts with Ms. Capps. 
Yes, it's uh, certainly a crisis of affordability here in the first district and throughout the county. And just to put some numbers on it, our vacancy rate, as people are probably well aware of, is 1.9%, where our state is 26 and our national is much higher. So we do have a crisis. I bring it back to poverty because, again, uh, it's an area in which I've worked on. And the, the truth is the, the kernel of our housing crisis is that people are living in too much poverty. And these are folks who are working sometimes two, three jobs. Again, we have the second highest rate of poverty in the state, and our state has the highest rate of poverty in the entire country. So I want to change that, and housing is key to that. Um, I believe the county's role is really to partner with the cities. The cities are where most people live. Of course, in unincorporated, there's developments as well. Um, I, I support a lot of the ideas that have been talked about our state just, just this today. Um, uh, our legislature uh, voted down SB 50. There's ideas that have bantered around, like inclusionary zones. I'm supportive of those kind of things. I'm in, uh, supportive of ADUs where appropriate. I think it's really important to make sure it's where appropriate. Um, I'm uh, very supportive of assistance, but I want new ideas, and that's where I want to get to the point fresh ideas, and that's where my experience in this network of local elected officials, I learn about these things. Here's one. In Cincinnati, they've passed a great program. The biggest barrier to affordable housing is access. Thank you. Oh, shoot. All right. I'll come back to it. <laughs> All right. And now Mr. Williams. So according to federal data, we're actually uh, 30th of 58 uh, counties in the state uh, in poverty. The reason why... Um, uh, Ms. Caps can say second is the uh, PPAIC uh, did a study to try to adjust that by housing information. So our housing prices is what takes us from 30th in poverty out of 58 to second in poverty out of 58. And so that is why housing is such an important issue to address. It is also the important one to address because um, our quality of life. We used to be against, you know, growth because we didn't want it to impact our, our quality of life um, because it would create too much housing, too much uh, traffic. Now, our lack of housing is creating too much traffic. The vehicle miles traveled that Santa Barbara and Carpinteria and Goleta workers are doing is going up and up and up. And so, the principles of good planning really are are, are simple. We need housing closer to the jobs. And that does mean often in the most urbanized areas, parts of the, of the district, but occasionally there are opportunities close to jobs and close to services um, uh, or close to schools in un unincorporated areas. And I think the courage on housing is difficult, but the courage in the next year will be vital because there are housing opportunities in the county. Thank you, thank you. Well, I mean, I mean, another area of uh, interest was having to do with our public lands, which are valuable, cherished, and in some cases inadequately protected or maintained. So two questions. What is your favorite county park? And as supervisor, what do you propose doing for our county public lands? And we start with Mr. Capps. I'm mean, sorry, Mr. Williams. Um, the... Uh, well, my favorite one is Rincon Park, because I'm a surfer, okay? Um, and because, uh, because the county has installed electric charging there, you can carbon-free surf. And there's nothing more fulfilling in this world than surfing without any uh, uh, carbon emissions, I gotta tell you. Um, uh, uh, especially if someday you hope to do that with your daughters. Um, so, um, the, our public lands are vital. That's why I've fought to protect them. That's why I've fought against uh, the Trump administration to drill oil in our public lands in this county, uh, including in sites um, a stone's throw away from Kate School in Carpinteria. And so uh, we need to fight vigorously, um, and we have done so in the rhetorical debates of letters and the public sphere. Um, we also need to do so um, in a manner to make sure that we don't look like hypocrites to the rest of the world, which is we need to make sure that we adopt uh, alternative energy, uh, electric cars, transit, so that our, um, 
opposition to oil doesn't become undermined by people outside of Santa Barbara County thinking that we're not practicing what we preach. Thank you, Ms. Caps. I'm just gonna finish my housing idea really quickly because it's important. So in Cincinnati, what they've done is created insurance for renters because the biggest barrier, one of the biggest barriers to affordable housing is the first and last month's rent plus security deposit. But if you could just have an insurance program like we have with cars, like we have with houses, et cetera, you can then, um, the landlords are supportive of this. So we need new, fresh ideas. This Cincinnati idea is working. They're starting it now in Virginia. I think we should be exporting good ideas elsewhere. When it comes to county parks, uh, it's a toss up. I grew up going to Halama a lot, uh, was part of junior lifeguards, and we'd have uh, competitions up there. I also love Manning Park in Montecito. Uh, did a lot of picnics there in, in school. Um, our county parks are really important. Our parks and lands are really important. I agree in terms of drilling. As an environmentalist, we need to be protecting our public lands, especially in the face of climate change and what we've seen to our trails and the devastation of our hillsides that are literally moving. So that's why my climate safety plan would put in mitigation efforts like we have with the nets, like we have with basins. What Again, what, what's the future of those protected lands that we need to be looking out for, not just for the land themselves, but for the people that live below the mountains, in the mountains? That's what I'm most concerned about. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess we should go back a little bit more to the housing here and uh, see what other plans that you may have. Uh, support for ADUs, what kinds of uh, policies do you have in terms of how the county should, um, would you recommend that they would adopt policies and how would you want to persuade um, county offices? And I guess we do start with uh, Ms. Capps. Yeah, ADUs um, are, imp part of the solution here. It's a challenging thing, but certainly as we saw with this legislation that failed today, it's hard to balance local control with the need for more housing, but certainly local control needs to dictate what we're doing, especially in the first district where we have such fire zone. And so I'm supportive in working with Councilwoman Snedden, who's here, is a supporter of mine, as well as Senator Jackson and our state leaders to find out how we can have an ADU plan for the first district that really works, that's, that's tailored to the first district with not just septic as a consideration how it is currently in Mission Canyon, but actually looking into fire, looking into the fact that evacuations are a normal way of life, unfortunately, in this new normal of climate change. So again, I'm supportive of ADUs in the first district, but just wanna make sure that safety prevails and quality of life prevails as well, with balance with the need for more housing. Okay. Mr. Williams. Well, that's already in the county code. I mean, the state law per permitted uh, permutations that were already in community plans, and we already have a community plan in Mission Canyon, uh, the county portion of Mission Canyon, that prohibits ADUs uh, because of the high fire um, impact. Now, I do support ADUs. Um, uh, uh, those are accessory dwelling units, uh, okay. commonly known as granny flats. They are the lowest impact in terms of uh, uh, on the infrastructure or so forth. Unfortunately, their development costs are high, even when you really try to um, uh, reduce those. So they'll be part of the housing solution, but they cannot be all of the housing solution. Um, we uh, Specifically, what I would propose is uh, a county employee housing on the, the old juvenile hall. Not only would I get a kick out of having my deputy sheriffs um, living at, at Juvenile Hall, um, but uh, I, uh, it's, it's just ridiculous that half the time that we have disasters, we have half of our emergency personnel on the wrong side of the disaster. Um, and uh, unfortunately, these folks are also commuting to the, or contributing to the nightmarish commute conditions that we experience in the first district. So if we really want, if the county really wants employers to build employee housing, we need to lead by example and do it ourselves. Thank you, thank you. And kind of again going on with the question of uh, properties, uh, should the county continue to regulate the use of private property in residential zones? And how do you approach land use and neighborhood compatibility issues arising from the shared economy of like Uber, 
Airbnb and vacation rentals, home businesses, those kinds of things. What would be your policies with that? And uh, we start with Mr. Williams. Well, I do think we should continue to regulate, though I would say reduce the amount from current um, regulation. There are some things that we do that we probably don't need to. There are things like a water heater installation that we might not any need inspections for, but we need someone who's a professional that's licensed having to sign a, a under penalty of perjury that they actually did it, things like that. Because there is so many things that county uh, planning and development do in um, regulating private homes that it makes it more difficult to do some of the sustainability changes that we want to have happen and it makes it more difficult you know basically to survive here in Santa Barbara so we are in the midst of a very big culture change uh, at planning and development which is why we hired a, a director that has uh, prominent experience both on the private side as a planner and on the public side as a guardian of the people Ms. Caps. Thank you. Yes, uh, and when it comes to property rights and what you've discussed, I think it's really important for the role of the county supervisor to listen as much as possible. And I say that, um, you can tell it's a theme of my campaign, but it's just the way that I approach work. And we do have community plans, we do have city councils. They need to be brought into the process from a very early stage with short-term rentals, with helicopter pads, et cetera. You have to have a robust process and, and go into it with an open mind. And again, that's why I think unbiased decisions are so important. So you shouldn't be funded, for example, just theoretically, uh, by a helicopter owner who's trying to get something through if you're actually regulating that balance between private property rights and a, a, a use that might infringe on them. Similarly, with cannabis, what happened in Carpinteria is that considerations to how that would impact private homes wasn't taken in, and the city councils were the city council of Carpinteria wasn't involved, and so now people are live, literally living next to a cannabis operation for the first time with the smell, with the impact of potential headaches, et cetera, without that sort of community involvement that's so important in local government. Local government, you can't. You need to get things right, and you need to be methodical, and you need to listen to people before rushing in and imposing a new form of an industry, an ind a disruptive industry like the ones you mentioned, like Airbnb, like other. You need to involve the community and not sort of foist it on them. Thank you, thank you. Well, here's a little more thoughtful question. Tell us about a time when you made a mistake as a leader and what you learned from it. And we start with Ms. Capps. Hmm. That's quite a question. <laughs> mistake as a leader a or a person? <laughs> I think you could use either one in this case, right? Oh, man. I make, I make mistakes all the time. Um, I just made one the other day uh, with, I don't know if I need to go into the details, but um, I, I just think it's important for leaders, it's important for humans to be able to say, you know what, I messed up. Um, and I apologize, and I want to make it better. That's something that's very comfortable for me as a person. Um, it's comfortable me, for me in my personal relationships, and I'm looking at my family. But it's also comfortable for me um, in my work life um, to just own up. I think it's important to take responsibility and to not sort of dig in. And um, yeah, I make mistakes all the time. I wish I had a concrete example for you, but um, I'm very uh, attuned with the ability to apologize. I think as public officials, and maybe this is something I saw in my parents, um, being honest and authentic is really important, and it's really hard. There's pressure, especially in the world of media, to not say, oops, I messed up. But people, people deserve that. People deserve the truth especially on the local level, when these decisions are so real. This isn't on CNN. This isn't some object thing. This is real stuff. And if we get it wrong, okay, let's fix it. That's what we need to do as public officials, and it's a space I believe I'm fairly comfortable in, humbly, I would say. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Williams. Well, I used to I used to uh, vote on your behalf two or 3,000 times a year on different pieces of legislation. Now I do it hundreds of times. So you, you don't get all of those right. Um, you try, you study, 
you weigh options, you look at downsides of um, what, what will happen if you get it wrong, um, and you try to get them right as often as possible, and you try to make sure that you keep working on policies. Um, and so, you know, I, I think um, the example that is being brought up a lot is marijuana. Did everything go perfectly? No way. There are a lot of problems. There is genuine nuisance in some neighborhoods. But do, are, am I working hard to fix that? Am I working hard to make sure that our law enforcement has sufficient resources to enforce it and make the rules real? Yes. Am I pushing our, our attorneys to sue folks who pr produce nuisance because they're bad actors? Yes. Do, am I going to resist any attempts uh, by folks to adjust upwards uh, the caps, which I've been asked to do by some of these same growers, I am not gonna adjust the caps upward. We need to get this right for the residents and we need to get this right for the workers, all of them, right? And Carpenteria is a small enough community, we can live together if we do things right. Thank you, thank you. Well, here's a very specific question. Do you believe that all county buildings should have solar power? Why or why not? And we'll start with Mr. Williams. Well, I believe that we should be 100% renewable energy. Um, building individual solar arrays for each county building is not uh, the most cost-effective way to do that. Um, I would like to build a five megawatt facility at our new jail, um, which is up uh, um, outside of Santa Maria. It has a lot of open field right next to it. That would be a very cost-effective way for us to provide power. And because we are joining, uh, we are leaving Southern California Edison's energy procurement, as I uh, said before, and joining what's called a community choice aggregation of, of five different counties. I've just been voted on the executive board. That will allow us to do things like aggregate our energy needs at uh, sites that are particularly suited for it. That being said, we need to do battery backup at a lot of these facilities, which we are doing uh, with solar. Uh, we're building the biggest microgrid thus far in the county out at the uh, North County campus for the county of solar and battery storage. And Ms. Capps. Yes, uh, absolutely. We should be exploring solar in every county building where it makes sense. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I ran for the school board. At the time that I ran, we didn't have one solar building in our school district. It's a school district that I grew up in, and it was pretty much the same as when I grew up. Um, and now we, are, we have solar. We're moving transformationally in a new direction because of the advocacy, because of the way that I've championed the need for our public institutions need to be leaders. They don't need to be coming from behind. And so now in our school district, we're moving. We just took the first vote in December the down payment to move towards microgrids again so that our schools are safe havens and that we're teaching our kids who are really the, the benefits of this horrible climate crisis that we are taking this seriously. I think our county needs to be doing even more. There's been some good gains in recent days in terms of uh, the wind farm, but I've been surprised and shocked as an advocate who's worked on climate for a long time nationally and here locally, that we've moved in the wrong direction in our, in our county. The Washington Post detailed that we're actually moving backwards when it comes to reducing our emissions, yet our county is the second warmest warming county in the entire country, second to Ventura. So we need a sense of urgency. I've been surprised that there hasn't been more of an urgency. Uh, that's the advocate in me. Let's, let's not take this, let's spend more time. Let's not spend as much time on a botched ordinance, but let's spend time on the, the real threat, the real priority of our county, and that's climate change. Thank you. The next question has to do with just gun violence. So what, uh, how would you address problems? How would you make sure that it's not uh, something that will continue in our area or develop in our area? Um, so what proposals do you have to reduce gun violence in the future? And I guess we'll start with uh, Ms. Capps. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, 
We need, uh, certainly the, the threat of gun violence is a new phenomenon, it's a crisis, it's, it's part of the ways in which this is a harder place to live than it was when I grew up here. Um, when I walk my son to school um, at Roosevelt, it unfortunately crosses our minds as we do as parents that we have to worry now about things that we didn't have to worry about before and we see this new epidemic. In the schools, I'll tell you that I've been a champion for school safety and gun violence specifically, pushing the staff to and the schools to have robust climate safe, uh, climate, uh, gun safety plans and we've hired a, a safety officer. We've really taken more of an initiative around this. It's, there's no, uh, we just have to try as many things as we can and we need to devote the energy um, to, towards it. But really these were, is where our public institutions need to be as proactive as possible. Ways in which corporations and private industries are leading the way in terms of evacuation plans and making sure that our, the people that live there, or that work there, are aware of what's happening. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Williams. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in the wake of the Isla Vista um, uh, shooting massacre of, of years ago, I authored uh, the first red flag law in the country that allowed uh, private individuals, roommates, family members, uh, to request a gun violence restraining order uh, to uh, take a weapon away from someone who posed a threat to themselves or others. Um, that right has been expanded to some other categories of individuals. Um, it's been a uh, successful strategy in the counties that use it. Um, so it, there's a differential between counties that where people know about it and request it, like Santa Barbara or San Diego County, and ones that where they don't. So um, if you're interested, go to speakforsafety.org, get the word out, um, because it is something that people need to know about. Um, and that uh, there's been a recent study, um, something I'm very proud of, the recent study that indicated um, there were uh, a few dozen um, uh, mass shootings that were avoided by this law in the state of California. I'm not quite sure how the researchers assessed that, um, but I nevertheless feel um, enormously proud if we can make some meaning out of tragedies to be able to avoid some in the future. This law is now in 18 states, and if uh, our Congressman Carbajal is successful, it will be national law someday. And um, we continue that work. We're part of the gun buyback every year uh, to get where we get hundreds of guns off the street. Thank you. The next question is, what? have you done or will you do to get more acute psychiatric beds in the county? And uh, we'll start with Mr. Williams. Well, um, we have been uh, facing a quandary. Um, we have such an increase of number of conserved individuals in this county that we keep on paying so much money for out of the county beds that it makes difficult for making the investments in the continuum of care. But we've just had to suck it up and make those investments anyway. We are right now building a uh, forensic uh, a puff to add to the existing psych units. Um, there's about 70 odd units in the, last, um, uh, in the last three years that we have expanded the continuum of care. Uh, those are, are uh, largely crisis residential or uh, categories sim similar to crisis residential. And uh, we are about to open up a new facility in Lompoc um, with help of a nonprofit contractor that will be the largest expansion of that care uh, for, it, this one is for conserved individuals for IMD beds. Um, this is a vital part of our strategy on homelessness. It's also a vital part of our strategy um, to be, to make the world look more like what it should. Um, and I'm proud that under my watch, we're having a larger expansion of our continuum of care in mental health than any other time in county history. Ms. Caps. Yeah, I agree. We need to, to stop the practice of spending money, more money than it would take to 
deal uh, with those in, in crisis here. And, and it's been a kind of a head scratcher for the last little while that we've spent so much money because we don't have the facilities here to take patients elsewhere. I'm such a champion of our director of mental health or, uh, well-being because she just seems to be such a visionary. And as a supervisor, I'd want to give her as much support as possible. I call it the social infrastructure. Actually, that's, that's a terminology that Janet Wolf uses because it's really making smart investments and making sure that we prioritize um, these sort of investments so that we can deal with those who are in crisis here, not spending more money elsewhere. I support the new uh, effort in Lompoc with the additional beds, but we need more of that. We need more of those ideas. And as supervisor, that's be something I'd be uh, intuitively um, interested in and very much a champion of in the spirit of Janet Wolf. Thanks. Thank you. Um, another question is about libraries. How do you view the role of libraries? How should this, uh, how should the county support library services in the first district and then throughout the county? And uh, Ms. Capps. Well, as a school board member, we certainly have the school district has. I can, I'm, I'm more familiar, I'll be honest, with the school district's relationship with libraries. Um, I certainly grew up coming to this library. Our libraries need to be supported. Our county needs to support them. Our kids need to come first. And just more generally, I believe that when we make decisions that benefit our children, we benefit our entire county. And libraries certainly serve children, but they also serve adults. They serve adults in all stages of life, and they need to be supported by our county. We need more funding, and I understand there's been a lot of turf issues uh, related to libraries. I can just tell you generally that I'm not a turf person, that I approach things very open-mindedly, <laughs> that I've known as a collaborator, and it's unfortunate that our libraries here locally in, far, in terms of this county has been sort of mired in some of those politics that just detract from the ultimate goal, which is really supporting uh, the, the, the legacy of public libraries. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Yes. Well, when you don't have resources, um, people fight over the scraps or they fight over the bones. And so um, that is why we have increased our library funding. Our small libraries really were on death's door. Um, and that has happened with a combination of general fund money and the marijuana tax. Um, uh, that is really the only um, bright light on the horizon of sustainable funding. Um, we have improved our budget by um, a, couple, a couple different moves, but one of the biggest has been the marijuana tax, which also pays for, again, much of our sustainability um, and lowering carbon emissions work, as well as our parks and uh, deferred maintenance work. Um, so uh, going forward, the only way to reach a sort of, uh, to go from trying to just triage the bleeding in libraries, but to be aspirational and see what they truly can be, is going to be to have a, a, a sustainable funding. And we uh, think that this year um, there will be a dramatic increase in library funding, um, and largely because we finally, in all the library groups, have come up with some actual methodology of how to allocate those monies in a way that all libraries would be benefiting in the long run. Uh, Carpinterias was one of the save, one of those, thank you those ones much. saved, and Montecito was okay. another. Thank you. Um, kind of going back again to the whole issue of um, being able to cover and, and represent the whole uh, first district. It is large, it is a diverse community. How do you plan to cover the territory, maintain community relations, and share power? with all different agencies. And I guess we start with um, Mr. Williams. Well, by um, ringing a lot of doorbells and covering a lot of ground. Um, uh, we uh, represent um, the whole district. That includes Kuyama, which is two hours away. So uh, one of the first things I did as your supervisor is buy an electric vehicle where I can go far enough to Kuyama and back on one, on one charge. Um, uh, my old electric vehicle did not. Um, and we get out there um, and participate in an area that has, uh, you know, bone-crushing poverty uh, and uh, has real problems. Uh, 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 and um, there are real problems throughout the first district, both in the areas of upper income and areas of lower income. Um, we need real solid economic development. The best uh, solution for poverty is high-paying wages. 
um, not just the, the welfare and mental health programs that we at the county do. By the way, poverty is, um, and public safety is basically 90% of what we do. Um, and um, uh, I think that the strategy of meeting with the neighborhood associations, so one of the things I do is um, monthly meet with the neighborhood associations that have a, a routine with us. Summerlin Neighborhood Association, Mission Canyon Neighborhood Association, the Montecito Association, uh, because that's one of the ways to stay uh, in close contact with folks. Thank you. And Ms. Capps. Yeah, constituent service is something that I love. I've worked in Congress. I worked for a senator who was just legendary when it came to constituent service. I certainly saw that example here locally uh, with our representatives. And that's what really the role of the county supervisor is almost entirely about, is taking care of people. And that requires listening. And I keep coming back to that word because it's important. Um, the approach that George Washington took to leadership was first you listen, then you learn, then you see how you can help, and only then do you lead. So leadership requires that first initial step, and that's just the way that I'm wired. It's the way that I approach my job as a school board member, which is largely volunteer, but tends to prioritize my day. It matters to me to make sure that whether it's a parent with a problem with their child or a city council that feels as though they were left out of a process, it's really important to be as proactive as possible. And it would be a delight to have a team in the county that's devoted to doing that. I want to correct one thing about the revenue from cannabis. It's not doing all of these things with climate and schools and uh, libraries. It just isn't possible when you look at the math. Most of the revenue that's coming in has been devoted to enforcement. It's not this catch-all, be-all that we, can, we often hear about. It really just doesn't add up if you look at the numbers. So I wish that it were. That would make more of the downsides worth it if the upsides were actually there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our youngest um, uh, Visitor here is not here right now, but I have this lovely picture that was written. <laughs> that is, what will you do to uh, about child safety and better playgrounds? Oh, here he comes. So we'll let Miss Cap start with that if you'd like. <laughs> so, Miss, you I guess I better answer that well. <laughs> Basketball at every school. How about that? Um, <laughs> No, uh, uh, certainly um, our school, our county, our schools are so important in this county, and we have such wonderful public schools. I know them well. Uh, I have the support of so many teachers, including our former superintendent of schools, Bill Cerrone, because as a school board member, um, if I serve and I have the privilege of being on the board of supervisors, like Janet Wolf, I'll be thinking about our kids. I'll be thinking about how can we partner so that our schools are strong. And these are partnerships that I already have. I know the principals. I know the assistant principals. Uh, and this would be an exciting part if I am elected at March 3rd to be able to be a champion for education, a champion for our kids, and make sure that our county is as, as cohesive as possible when it comes to their future. Mr. Williams. Well, uh, one of the initiatives that we have is to um, do an increased drive of Safe Route to Schools projects, because uh, there's projects that uh, don't qualify for the um, state grants, uh, but are still necessary to protect uh, children's safety. And so the board decided in a hearing a couple months ago that we would look at allocating marijuana tax revenue to Safe Route to School uh, projects and we'll see that come back and back to the board sometime in the next month. Um, and I just, you know, I'd, I've tried to stay very, very positive with lots of attacks, but I do have to set the record straight. You know, you can't just dismiss facts like the money that we've spent um, uh, because it's, it's right here, and if you want it, I'll give it to you. Uh, this is an accounting from Rachel Lipman, um, our uh, budget person in the CEO's department, of the things that my opponent just told, uh, told you we didn't spend on, that we did. Libraries, sustainability through our alternative commute and our utility grade solar ordinance, um, you know, our deferred maintenance. Um, this is what we spend it on, and I'll, I'll give it to you, uh, starting with you. Are you 
you're passing. Okay. I think we're ready to go on to the next uh, question as well. Mr. Williams, if we're ready, we can go back to the next question. Thank you. Okay. So we're going back to protection of species habitat, open spaces, and other environmental values. How are you balance this against property rights and growth needs? And that does start with Mr. Williams. Could you rephrase that one more time? Mm -hmm. How should protection of species habitat, open space, and other environmental values be balanced against property rights and growth needs? Well, I think the criteria in CEQA, of the criteria of CEQA, um, uh, protection of endangered species is one of the things that are, is most vital. Uh, CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act. It's the, that which the law that protects um, uh, various uh, aspects of environmental impacts from a development and requires disclosure in cases of, um, uh, of impacts that can be mitigated or not mitigated. Um, I do think that what, when I talk about the need for affordable housing, I you know, really think that on open spaces away from cities uh, is not usually the right way to address affordable housing. You want it closer to jobs where you can reduce traffic impacts instead of exacerbate them. Um, and uh, that, you know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we want agriculture to thrive is because we don't want suburban sprawl. Um, so, uh, you know, good, good planning indicates you put those, the, that housing close to jobs. It also indicates it's more complex that, than that too. It means that you need units um, that are, have large enough bed, or enough bedrooms, but small enough size that more of them will be bought by workforce individuals instead of people wanting vacation homes. This is a real problem in, in Santa Barbara. We, 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 we need the units targeted towards the actual workforce and the residents that need them. Thank you, and Ms. Caps. Yeah, this is where a balanced approach needs to prevail, and certainly I understand uh, pr uh, property rights, but um, as an environmentalist, um, we have uh, those concerns as well, and I bring up the example of those in Montecito who raised funding and had the vision for the nets, and certainly a lot of that um, involved a balance between environmental concerns, but in this case with, again, climate change and the new normal, um, we have to take things all sides into consideration and, and have a good dialogue um, with the groups that are advocating on either side and make sure that uh, balanced decisions are made. Thank you. Um, we'll just take one here about the view of how various special districts that furnish water, sanitary, fire protection districts operate, whether they should be reconfigured or merged or should be treated in some other way. And uh, we'll start with Ms. Capps. Yeah, well, the one that I'm uh, more familiar with is the proposal that was at least initiated um, in Montecito, and, and most folks weren't so too supportive of it um, because things are working well in terms of a fire department that folks in Montecito actually know their firefighter. So they are they are used to a very high level of service. The fire chief, Kevin Taylor, is an exemplary fire chief. And so to explore a community service district in Montecito after discussion initiated um, uh, by some, um, it was determined that this would actually reduce the ingenuity, it would reduce the individuality, it would reduce the effectiveness of the districts that were already functioning well there. So that's the one I'm familiar with. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Well, uh, while I served you in the uh, state legislature, we did uh, cooperate with a consolidation of school district um, in, and actually two consolidations. Um, uh, one uh, it was in Santa Paula. Um, and uh, that created better, um, uh, re more resources directed to the student because um, the, uh, uh, you didn't have two different superintendents and two different school boards and all that sort of thing. Um, the second was the consolidation um, uh, uh, in, of the Santa Barbara now unified school district. I had to run a bill to do that. Now, they were already kind of operating together with the same school board and superintendent, so it was, wasn't quite uh, economies of scale, but it did increase our funding levels at the time. And so uh, those are the two uh, things, and, and it's one of the biggest issues that, that I have, is at the end of the day, uh, you need to assess policies by which how they help 
or hurt schools, how they help or hurt students. Um, that's why I served on the Assembly Education Committee, uh, despite the fact that it's a place where the knives are just drawn and plunged into people all the time, um, but because I care about the result, the result being better students, better, students, better funding for uh, our future. Um, I think in cases, there are arguments to be made for and against. I agree with both in the terms of the consolidation of the wastewater and, and, and sanitary district in Montecito. Nobody actually wanted the fire district consolidated. Um, I don't care as long as we get recycled water, which is a vital Thank strategy for much. our drought resistance. Thank you. One uh, question at this point, um, and I think this will be her last question, um, and that will be because the long-term disaster of two years ago has had a very major effect, what strengths will you bring to the first district office and county to continue supporting the recovery in years ahead? And uh, we start with Mr. Williams. Well, we uh, have on our staff um, the, the woman, one of the two staffers that staff the Montecito Recovery Center. Um, uh, uh, she has an extensive experience working with all the people that um, are uh, rebuilding or have already rebuilt. Um, we uh, have Darcel Elliott. I hope some of you guys know, him, know her. Um, she has worked for me since 2008. So I have really strong staff work um, and have gotten very um, uh, close to folks trying to rebuild and recover and help them. We built, we uh, passed an ordinance to help streamline the process to make sure that they would have a chance of economic survivability by speeding up the land use process. Um, that means people are starting to get back in their homes. Um, the other part of uh, resilience and recovery though is is the flood control work. And that's why I've pushed, cajoled, cooperated, done whatever it takes to get the county as an institution to move much faster than it's used to moving uh, in terms of our flood control work. That is why we have $45 million worth of flood control projects in Carpinteria and Montecito planned in the next two years. Um, uh, that is a substantial increase in infrastructure. It will increase our resilience and um, our level of safety. Thank you. And Ms. Caps. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling for a climate safety plan. And being in this room, it reminds me of the food, safe, the food action plan that I was a part of. Some of you might have been part of it. Uh, many of the meetings happened here. And that's the, the model for what I'm calling for, which is when, with the food action plan, we looked at, with a variety of stakeholders, all aspects of the food system, from how it's grown, how it's picked, how it's transported, food waste, et cetera. Because it was such an issue, it touches on everything, hunger, poverty, climate, et cetera. I'm calling for a climate safety plan in the future of the first district, the future of our county, because it deserves that kind of attention and leadership to be as innovative as possible, as I've discussed. That means microgrids. That means water security and exploring aggressively, recycling, recharging our aquifers, now uh, paying more attention to groundwater. It, it requires harnessing innovation so that we're doing these things before the disaster. Again, the, the statistic bears repeating. For every dollar that we spend on preparedness saves us seven dollars in recovery. And I want to also address the issues of insurance and what folks are dealing with now in, in the area of the first district, in Mission Canyon, elsewhere, with not being able to get insurance for their homes because of the new normal that we live. I want to be an advocate with our insurance commissioner, have him here all the time, be as proactive as I possibly can to make sure that people who are really trying to figure out how can I make this work, knowing that this is the deal now, these evacuations are the deal. That's the kind of leader, that's the kind of proactive partner Thank I you want to be. very much. And now we are going to closing statements. Those are two minutes each, and we do start with Ms. Capps. Great. Well, thank you to Doss Williams. Thanks to everybody who's been here. Um, again, to the League and all of you who are here and to my family. It's been nice to engage in this dialogue. I believe that democracy is born in conversation. It's been a privilege to even have the chance to run in this race, to be a candidate for the first district supervisor. And soon we'll be voting. Actually, ballots come out next week. Um, two years, uh, 16 years ago, I was working in the Iowa caucuses right now, so I'm thinking about Iowa. But it, it's time to think about here soon. And I'm going to ask for your vote and let you know that a vote for me 
is a vote to put you, the people, in charge and to sideline the special interests, such as cannabis, that have been a massive distraction for our county and has caused so much turmoil. A vote for me is a vote for honest government. Let's move away from transactional politics. A vote for me is someone who understands that leadership isn't about taking credit, it's about taking responsibility. A vote for me is a vote to make climate change front and center in this county. A vote for me is to tackle our high poverty rate and our housing affordability crisis. And a vote for me is a vote for our children. It's why I'm running, because when we do right by our children in this county, and I'm gonna keep saying it throughout this campaign, we do right by our entire county, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Williams, let's please hold our applause. We'll have time for it. Thank you. Well, at election time, I think it's hard to discern uh, truth with various opinions um, and charges thrown and bantered about. Um, so I would ask you to consider. You're probably going, oh, well, what do I believe? Who, do, who to believe? Uh, I ask you to consider um, who is supporting me. Do you, do you trust your firefighters and deputy sheriffs? They would not support someone who has a marijuana policy that would undermine public safety. They have an, are supporting me because of rational public policy and leadership in the disasters. Do you trust the Sierra Club? The Sierra Club, has, the Sierra Club wouldn't endorse someone that was, you know, wasn't fighting hard for the environment and against climate change. They have endorsed me because I um, will set my hair on fire if that's what it takes to get the institution moving on sustainability because we're only procuring electric vehicles for our sedan fleet, because we are moving to 100% renewable, because we are actually legalizing utility scale solar in this county. Um, I'm supported by the Women's Political Committee the most prominent feminist organization in the county. They would not be supporting me if I was not a dedicated feminist that believed in mentoring women leaders that produce public policy that is good for women and families. I'm supported by hundreds of young families in the north side of Carpinteria that are the ones that potentially would be the most impacted by marijuana as a nuisance, but are also impacted by our schools and our Carpinteria school. I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, and they and those young families wouldn't be supporting me if I didn't have the families of Carpinteria foremost much, in my Mr. mind. Mr. Williams. And now, uh, I, we're at, in closing, I would like to thank you for coming. Uh, thanks to TVSB for the video, Gary Atkin Sound System for audio, Transil Pro for translation, the public library, and all the volunteers of the League of Women Voters uh, who helped this forum. Now, for your information, the League will hold two additional candidate forums. A forum with candidates for the 37th Assembly District will be held next Tuesday, February 4th, 6 to 8 p.m. in the Carpinteria City Hall. Then on the next Thursday, February 6, 6 to 8 p.m., a forum with the candidates for the third district county supervisor will be conducted at the Goleta Community Center. Thank you, candidates, for joining us this evening. And I think we can give them a nice round of applause. And we appreciate your commitment. <laughs> we, we do appreciate your commitment to serving our community. Thank you to the audience as well for joining us. We hope you found the program informative and useful as you prepare to vote. And lastly, please make sure you are correctly registered to vote and vote. Your vote matters. Good evening. <laughs>